Apprentice. She instructs me in things I do not immediately understand. She tells me to stand alone, in the dark, with my eyes open. I complain that there is nothing to see. That is not the point, she tells me. The point is to practice, standing alone, in the dark, with your eyes open. For Intazaki Shange. When Intazaki spoke, a white woman in the audience got extremely uptight. When after several minutes of naming the games that white women in their self-perpetuating ignorance can play, when after several minutes, the poet said slowly, perhaps this is not true of all white women. The woman behind me yelled, thank you, with as much hostility as gratitude. To that sister, I say this, that we as white women must simply listen now, that we as white women must not interrupt this tapestry of truth, that we as white women must unlearn our whiteness, and I expect you to understand that your outburst tonight is as absolutely offensive as the inane conversation of the male to my right, whose presence here should be repaid by him by his enforced silence, but who instead waxes inadequate on how anger can only take one so far, missing the point entirely. For the Poets I sit alone in diners, at the red-yellow counters of luncheonettes, thinking of the letters I will write, the questions I will ask, are you well? The things I will say, the weather is here, wish you were wonderful. The information I will share, my life is okay, just going not so silently mad, the weather is clear, wish I were fine. And sometimes, when the urge is great, like now, I start composing on placemats, napkins, tablecloths, wrapping them carefully folded into my pocket to be resurrected later, transferred to conventional paper convenient for posting, lest you receive the original on standard diner napkin and decide that I finally have lost it after all. Losing it. It occurred to me somewhere halfway across the grocery store parking lot that I have been for the past five years losing it, little by little losing it. Sometimes it slips away, sometimes I throw it away, but the loss remains constant. The fear of discarding too much, of finding myself alone in a place with no support whatsoever, this is my fear. It is a terror easily explained. You stand in a 14-room house and one day know that it's just not right anymore, never was. Not the construction, not the function it purports to serve, nothing. So one day you discard a room, then another, and another. This kitchen does not feed us as it promised it must go. These bedrooms give no rest, go. This study, no room for thought, go. Each thing that was a lie you axe off till you find yourself in a place the size of a postage stamp. And in the midst of wondering what the hell to do next, someone, invariably in a 30-room house, says, I envy you, your wide range of options. Part of the mythology of liberation. Eventually, though, you must move, so you either close down your senses, move into another huge house and go mad, or find a smaller one, negate just a few of your perceptions, and go mad, or... Take the maddening step off the stamp, into the space between rooms, into a place between places, a form no architect has yet drawn, a place not in the original blueprints, and let your madness rage around you until the clarity comes. It occurred to me somewhere halfway across the grocery store parking lot that I have been for the past five years losing it. Till now all there is is this tenuous grip. And somewhere, in the crowd of my mind, there is a woman yelling, Let go! Let go! Emergence. Greetings to a homophobe. You glance quickly past me, cross this street, avert your eyes, 
Do I disturb you? Is it embarrassment or lust? Fear of queerdom, perhaps? Guilt by association? Who might smirk if you say hello? Assume your raised hand, simple smile, proves you my consort in unspeakable acts. For weeks I pondered, considered an approach, how to ask if I had somehow unknowing offended. Yesterday, when you hastened up the street, dragged your child too quickly to the door, I finally understood that I was worried all this time about offense to the wrong party. Tonight I light a candle, sing a song into your heart of anger and forgiveness. Tonight I pray your daughter a gentler life than the one that has left you pained and hard. Today I walk the streets alive, smile to those who smile at me, and leave you your shadows to run to and hide. Processional They bear his body gently, reverence, last of the shamans, his death comes hard. No heir, no apprentice, seduced away by city lies. He waited, none came. The pyre at work, fire releasing his sorrow, peace at last. The ashes drift to the ones who come. Tonight, one child dreams a shaman's dream. Space Program That we can sit together in this room, me entranced by the music and you alone in your book. That we can sit here, together, in this room, Silent but for Jared's hammer wire song is so simple. That I should be able to sit here now, typing what is not will never be a good poem, and have you smile but not interrupt, not even to tell me you are happy for the clack 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 of the keys, not to be sure that the poem is for you, not to ask what it is I write. After years of lovers who wanted space, needed space, needed less and less of me, Convinced me I needed too much, wanted too much, expected too much. After years of a lover who insisted on my presence every waking moment, who wanted me holding her, touching her every moment, needing me to need her every moment, I thought I would go mad if she would not leave me some peace, a little place in me that was mine. She would not sit with me in a room and let me work would only always try engaging me in conversations, tell me stories about people she knew were unimportant even to her. Stories and stories the woman should write, she has so many good characters, but all they did was keep me from my work. In the two years I tried to love her, I abandoned my words, or they left me, chased by a jealous woman. So to sit here with you, Room silent but for the keys of this machine and Jared's is amazing. And is my answer, I suppose, when others ask behind knowing worried smirks, anxious to find our politics lacking, how on earth the two of us can spend so much time in the same space? Mother's Day Whenever I hear of some woman's mother dying, I cannot help but see you, features set, soft blue eyes closed, still, so still, resting finally on that white satin pillow. I cannot keep these pictures from my mind. I cannot imagine surviving you. How do I write a poem for the one who gave me life? How do I sing a song to the first woman I loved? to the one who taught me gentleness, integrity, and self-respect. When I try to write, all I can think of is thank you, which is, of course, incredibly trite, and in any case not nearly enough. How do I write a poem to the woman who has listened and understood when I came home with all my transformations, when I came home saying, Mom, I can't marry him. Mom, I'm a feminist. Mom, I'm an anarchist. 
Mom, I'm a lesbian. Mom, I'm being investigated. Now I don't know by whom. Just know the phone is tapped. All my mail comes already opened. They don't even bother trying to hide it, and I'm followed wherever I go. What do I say to the woman who told me it would be worse to marry if you don't love him? I'm proud of you. I worry for you. For you, it must have been like coming home. And you must understand this, she said, that even when your father and I don't agree with what you do, we still believe in you and are proud. So if they come for you, they will have us to contend with as well. What do I write? What is appropriate to say to this woman whose life is my finest teacher, whose death I cannot even imagine without wailing, keening in grief? I have written love poems to the women with whom I have shared a bed, a life, a moment. And I cannot seem to find words for you with whom I shared a body, a life, and all these years. You tell me, it isn't important that you write me poems. I know you love me. I know how you feel. But it is important. So very important. I cannot imagine surviving you. Our Sisters Walk Our sisters walk with eyes downcast. Their feet shuffle and scrape across the earth. They dare not look skyward. They dare not lift their feet lest they be accused of flying. They remember the flames too well. And here, around this open fire, the other twelve and I sit, each igniting the witch within, as we try, in our way, to stem the assault. Elsewhere, there are others who keep count. Nine million one, nine million two, nine million three. Ex-vocation. I will no longer stand here pleading, hand outstretched, waiting for you to give what you swear I already possess. It is finally more ludicrous than painful. I end it. It is over now. I say so. We talk within the tribe. We talk within the tribe of the time to come. We say, in the time beyond the struggle, all women will live without fear, all children will have all they need, and all our gatherings will be joyous. We say, in the time beyond the struggle, we will live for life, not death. We will know what it is to cherish the earth, and all our cups will be full. I say this, it is time to know that this is the time of the struggle. Feel it. Understand how we are at war. See how daily it kills us. Today, the time is not coming. The time is here. I say this, the time beyond the struggle does not exist. The battle will always be with us. It is the forms, the contents only, that will change. In that time, our struggles will be of growth, not conflict, a battle of wands, not swords, and more often than now, our cups will be full. I say to exist in this time, we must create the other, now. To survive this time, we must be now who we envision, must live now the lives we see in our futures, must do now the things we believe we will, in the time beyond the struggle. I say we must live now, a tribe of women beyond fear, give to our children all we can, and let all our celebrations be joyous. Convergence They come always at night, when I am tired, slip through the defenses, through the tiniest cracks in the citadel walls, separate at first, and then in a rush converging. Memory is their form, memories of a time when the enemy was overt, dealt with clearly, external. They move with the ease that comes of harmony, the freedoms taken for granted, to ride bareback through grass-green fields, 
to watch the children play secure in their safety, to work hard, laughing, singing, breasts bare to the warm sun, to rest, collapsed in each other's strong, weary arms, to gather together around the council fire, planning the season's planting, or hunting, or harvest. They creep past my window, and when the sentry is elsewhere, sneak in, surround my bed, light a soft candle, wake me gently, and whisper, Remember. They come in the form of visions, a time beyond this time, a time beyond this struggle. They move with the ease of the freedoms we will surely take for granted, an earth cleansed having ridden herself of the poisons, a cosmos in harmony, each creature understanding the other's part, its own, affirmation replacing necrophilia, the return of the mother. And they come together, the memories creeping, warriors keeping to the shadows, and the visions rushing, children born of freedom fearing nothing and no one. They come together, showing me who we have been and who we become. They leave me crying, caught in this time between times, this time of strife, born of an enemy unclear, covert. Simple combat will not suffice, nor simple spells. This will take two lifetimes at least of struggle, two lifetimes at least of striking where possible, of hiding together when the burning begins. And this lifetime, this time of living with the converging, this time of living with the knowledge that I cannot truly go back, will not remember this when we have gone ahead. The sentry returns. The sun begins to rise. They depart with the dawn, and I am alone. The Coming of the Crone Persephone Descending 1. I want to sit tonight and write for hours. Want to assume my black robe, light one white candle, and sit in a room dark, close, warm, almost wet, cavernous. I sit instead in my 3 a.m. kitchen, the light above glaring, the walls electric blue and square, wrapping myself in thermal white that doesn't quite keep out the cold, oven on and open for heat. My fingers cramp around the icy pen, my thoughts a jumble of frustrated musings. Sometimes I wonder why I write it all. Two. I want tonight to call my dearest friend. Tell her that she must tell me which of all my coveted books she truly wants most. Tell her that I am selling today everything I own, giving away everything I cannot sell. Tell her that the critically thinned blood my body has deigned to keep leaves me no strength to work, no way to so much as cross a room without pain and incredible fatigue. How to tell her I am releasing my hold on everything I hold. Sure somehow that if I survive until April, I will be around for years to come. Unsure that I will survive until April. Unsure that I will last out the month. Considering if the anemia doesn't kill me, or the bleeding in my belly, that I may just be tired enough. Exhaustion, not desperation, is my nemesis now may just be resigned enough to finish the demolition my betraying body has begun. She will think me mad. 3. I want to write tonight to my mother. Tell her that she must agree on my death to turn my body over to the women I love. No embalming. No elaborate casket. Most important, no sorrow-cloaked boy hurling words over me. Acolyte to the myth of some male creator, that clown in whose name my sisters have been burned, drowned, boiled in oil, dismembered, and perhaps fortunately ignored. She must promise to release me to those who will speak to my spirit, send it on with love, shared memories, poetry, and tears, who will scatter my ashes somewhere sacred, women's land or pagan land anywhere. She will think me simply depressed. 4. I feel somehow that I have been for the past two months preparing for my death, 
preparing for some major purge. Do not think me mad, or even simply depressed. Give me some credit for insight, strong dreaming, and readiness. Give me a dark room, my black robe, one white candle, and someone to sing me my name. The Last Poem Note left in a bank burned by anarchists in West Berlin read, Make kaput what makes you kaput. Listen, I have something to tell you. Do you want to know? Are you ready? Will you hear it? Wait. Do not agree unless you are willing to lose all you hold. Do not agree until you are prepared to abandon all other plans. Do not open yourself to it if you cannot see yourself transformed. I have something to tell you. It leaves me devastated, almost destroyed. I who consider myself a strong and powerful woman. Will you hear then? It is quite simple, really. It is this. We no longer have a choice. No room left for choosing. This is it. This is the script, and it's time to acknowledge that the curtain went up while we were still working out how to stage the rehearsals. Our parts are clear. No time now to discuss living in tribes, mutual responsibility, healing ourselves and one another. No time to sit and debate whether or not we as women can afford to choose violence. Understand me, we have no choices left, no choice but to live together in tribes, accept total responsibility for our collective sanity, and heal ourselves and one another. We have no choices left, no choice but to see that every day we exist, we participate in, contribute to violence. Participating in violence, already, every moment, and against our own people. We have run out of time, and there are, in fact, no choices left. No choice but to seize the guns and turn them away from our own heads, away from the heads of our children, turn them back on the makers of guns, the sellers of guns, those who benefit from the power of guns. Our tactics must be ambush and retreat, ambush and retreat. Our targets must be those for whom it is advantageous, this systematic dehumanization of women, this total disregard of children, this complete despoliation of the earth. The target must be those who, in their arrogance and lack of sight, sacrifice even their own brothers. Let me be blunt. The purpose of this poem is to advocate the negation of the negators, the destruction of the destroyers, the death of the killers. The function of this poem is to incite us all to revolution. To Ride the Nightmare I ride the nightmare into your dreams come to you in this the only way I know to span the distance. Do you allow? We come gathering darkness around us, cloaking myself in the mists that abide here. I call to them softly, speaking their secret names to bind our trust, grasp them gently, my fingers closing upon the edges of shadows, coax the fabric of them around my head, around my shoulders. They float down to cover me, to wrap around my open body. Do you allow? My companion is at home here, this more her domain than mine. The shadows greet her, swirl a playful welcome around her silky ears. She paws the mists, a recognition. She communicates fatigue. Her dark sky-black coat shines wet with the strain of this journey. Do you allow us? We turn to you. Cautious, you regard the image. My legs hug her sides, my hand strokes her neck, our bodies meet, no barrier between her flesh and my flesh. You catch the scent of me in her nostrils, the scent of her in my own. In silhouette we are one creature, our faces aglow against the background of mist. Do you allow us? We move to you. I feel the motion of every muscle under me. 
She senses every move I make. She nods, feels me release my hand from her soft, dark neck as I reach for you. I open my arms wide, palms up, infinitely slow. Do you allow us? We are closer now. I reach slowly, touch my hand to your cheek. Something soft and warm passes between us. I take your hand, place it gently against the mare's neck. You feel the strength of the muscles beneath her skin, feel the dark, wet smooth of her coat. You stand for a moment, silent. Do you allow us? You look to me, search my eyes for something you can trust. The mare nuzzles your shoulder. I hold out my hand. Do you allow us our presence here? You remove your touch from the dark one's mane. Your hand reaches for my hand. You grasp my arm firmly and hold. I fear in that instant that you may try to unseat me, try in one sharp moment to separate me from the mare. I prepare myself. We hold tight to one another. I do not move to pull away. Your eyes have not left my eyes. We stand there frozen, the tension between us almost visible, a separate entity who joins us. Out loud now, calm and clear, do you allow us our presence here? You smile, your movement easy. Still holding my arm, you glide to the mare's back. Seat yourself behind me, wrap your legs around her belly and your arms around my own. Your face all soft now. Close to my neck, you lick your answer into my waiting ear. I do allow. The mare snorts her celebration. My body relaxes into you. Too soon, the fabric begins to recede, the mists signaling the end of the dream. I am called back into myself, many miles and a lifetime away. We look to one another. The mare is our witness. The function of this time is the coming together. Next time, my sister, we ride. Mantra for a Melanoma My life is my own. I claim it now, finally, irrevocably, and perhaps too late. Cancer, he said, and I heard no more. Two or three minutes I sat mute. Wise, he filled the time with other talk. The first terror over and the next, I make promises to myself and break them and promise once again. I spend the day furious at tests and waiting rooms, too many hours in the car on the way to or from a well-appointed, well-intentioned office. Yesterday, I marveled at the dearth of blood. My cycles are lunar and legendary. Friends and lovers joke always of the mass of crimson that christens even the newest, even the most carefully slept-in sheets. But yesterday, midstream, three days after the deluge began, it ended. I started, amazed. Yesterday I prided myself on my courage, honored the matter-of-fact way I faced the next cycle of tests. When I left his office, mentally rearranging my schedule, making certain the surgery slips effortless around meetings and budgets. Yesterday, walking out his door, I felt the tide swell again and break against the soft shore of my thigh. The body knows. The womb, life-giver, listens hard. Life threatened, the body heard. The womb, fiercely protective, held its breath, until, assured, it allowed. I listen too now, hard as the uterus and as full of promise. As long as the hope is as strong as the fear, the body continues, and trusting releases the life blood, secure in its renewal. As long as the hope is as strong as the fear, the heart continues. The song comes rhythmic as I wash this sacred blood from my own hands. My life is my own. I am alive until I am not. 
I refuse to die before my death. This is my life. I choose it. I choose it. Finally and just in time. The Journey Unbidden Awake Again Night Icy flesh in a warm summer bed Enraged at the rage that insists I acknowledge The images I deny The horrors I will not accept Cannot allow to be real Exhausted Unnerved Numb I close my eyes, let out one long, slow breath, and plead release. The dark one comes, sister to my sorrow, wrapping silence around me, trail of her nightcape covering, helping me contain the tears and the pain. She offers her gift. The cape covers us both, cocoon-like and safe, and we are gone. Yemaya beckons, sun on gull wings, rush of playful water, silver on rock face smiling. I turn away, add a tear to her great gray-green. This time, this time, I cannot go. Persephone leads, descending, the journey not difficult, only impossible. The stairway down black, somehow bright, brilliant. Child of earth, cavern wise, she leads me somehow to center. Rage, face the rage, touch it now. Images flash too fast to see, yet demand to be known. Like a sun too bright, I know it shines by its heat. Sadness comes, an old acquaintance unwelcome and insistent. She swells, demands recognition, bullfrog bravado all puffed up and false. Touch the fear, touch it, now. Samurai self, butterfly warrior, I take my wooden staff, try to dance the thing to death without touch. Not here, not now, not safe. Deeper still, past this first guard, darker and deeper, sea urchin self stands ground. Delicate and firm, surrounded by spikes none can easily touch. But no, not that lesson, not that way, not this time. Deeper still, somehow desert, shining lights, desolate and vibrant, open, so open for all to see, for me to see. And still I feel that too few eyes will look. This is not arrogance, only fear. The images dance, movie screen collages of terror and pain. Kitty Genovese stalks New York streets still. Wounded hands cover wounds, many watch their making. Safe within their homes, no one called for help. No reprieve, nowhere safe, still. This cannot be, this must not be. I cannot allow this to be. How can this be? Escape. Withdrawal to some place beyond, leaving earth behind, rising, dissipating, trails of my night cape touching earth, touching stars. It does no good. The pain comes too. I cannot leave her behind. No help here. My eyes still open. Beirut, Dachau, Belfast, Soweto. Don't touch. Don't touch. Do not touch. Not here. Not now. Not safe. Burying the dead does the living no good, only the earth. Burying the pain brings me no peace, only distance, and not even enough of that. Alone, chill, she has taken me as far as she, as guide, can go. On my own now, in unsafe territory and afraid. Echoes of truth. Siren sweet and deadly, let go, she whispers, let go and touch. The chorus approaches, filling the wings. No room for thought, no room for denial. I leave the theater and the swarm, but the production goes on. My closed eyes do not stop the pain or the play. It continues, without my permission or with it. Ghost-like, she comes again, called Kitty, 
Our mothers named us both Catherine. She insists this sisterhood demands she pass her truth on to me. Hesitant, she takes my trembling hand and slowly and one by one she places my screaming fingers against each jagged hole in what once was flesh. Release does not come, but the teacher. Ready then, I search her eyes, sifting memories and time, trying to learn to fight the fear but not feed it, to touch the pain and somehow not live it. Wish Your Will 1. The goblet passes hand to hand, the chalice raised, tipped, a few drops return to ground, to source in thanks. Eyes open, focused at the circle's center, the priestess nods and speaks, seeing the celebrant's readiness to weave. Wish your will. The cup is raised again. The dreamer images her request, forms the vision in the cup, speaks the image to the gathered, adding their energy to her own, and drink your fill, ingests the image, the wine as medium, sipping her desire that it may be so. Halfway round the circle I sit in dread. My will is silent. The place where once my magic lived has been near deserted for months. The flame, not out, burns low. Where the flame was is not cold, but numb. Halfway round the circle I sit in dread, fearing the passage. The cup is passed. The next weaver dreams, the silence in me screams, and immobile I turn within, run from these trusted few to the place where once my magic lived, and I grieve. 2. We want to take a week off this summer, I say, composed, that is, if my libido ever shows up. And how long has it been gone, she asks. She misses nothing, this one. I would not come here otherwise. Later, she asks, when you say love-making, what do you feel? And I cry. The place where once my magic lived fills with tears, and I grieve. Now, at last, feeling begins. Loss. I miss the heady rush that touch brings, miss the softness, the trust, the warmth, the ease with which lovers have moved into my heart, especially she whose fire surrounds me, curling cat quiet gentle and patient in my belly waiting. I wait. Perhaps this is a simple thing, a necessary reaction to having lived so long wide open, pretending safety in, in unsafe places. Maybe this is just about that last lover, the one who strangled my words, my power, my magic, myself. But this is too convenient, to blame another for the quiet in me. This is about my life, and the damage even that other has done cannot account for all this ruin. 3. I lie awake beside her sleeping form. Two years ago I would have reached for her before sleep, would have drawn her into the circle of me and kissed her sleepy eyes, her neck, unafraid that she might wake, hoping that she might wake, and that hours later, tired again, we might find the rest that now so eludes my reach. I search the place where once my magic lived, but all is silent. The halls ring hollow with my hello. 4. The goblet passes hand to hand. There is so much to ask for, so much I desire my passion back, damn it, my former ease, my lack of fear, my power, my magic, my passion, my power, my magic, my passion, my power, my magic, where to begin? Five. She passes the cup. I reach for her hand and the promise it once held. I hesitate. I have nothing to say. Words do not come for the first time in circle. Words do not come, only tears. When I open again my betraying eyes, the cup is gone. It rests easy in the priestess's hand. Our eyes meet. She nods and speaks, seeing this celebrant's uneasiness, reading my silence, hearing the salt on my cheeks. 
knowing, she stands, and spinning, changes the chant. The fire, the water, the air, the earth, return, return, return. The fire, the water, the air, the earth, return, return, return. The fire, the water, round and round we circle, again and again, one direction to another. Repeat the chant, transcend the words, evoke the changer, and let the season pass. The fire, minutes later or years, the water, the cup at peace in my hand, the air, I image acceptance, the earth, I picture deep night and the dawn. I speak not of magic or power or passion, but of readiness. I drink my fill, and in the place where once my magic lived, a hatchling phoenix wakes and smiles. When we have finished. When we have finished this dance of countless deaths, when we have swung the last time round the mothers we wanted, the fathers we might dare trust. When we have finished painting each other's faces, drawing the scowl lines in and the disapproval, dipping each other's hands in red like the drawn blood and stolen blush of each our remembered bodies. When we have finished writing the lines the old ways, when we complete the memories and can wade through hacking off bits and pieces, making stew parts of the dead, extricating ourselves from this cauldron of self-doubt and self-hate. When we have finished all this, my sister, and if we still dance the same ground, I will step forward again, offer my hand to a dance of renewal and creation, a dance finally and most certainly of our own design. How I want you. Like a peach, overripe and cool on a sticky hot day, sweet liquid sliding through my fingers, hurriedly gobbling trying to keep from losing it all to the grass below. Like snow peas, opening the firm soft pod slowly with my tongue, coaxing out the sweet green pearls one by one by one. Like honeysuckle, discovered first time, in awe of the gift, summer feast, free, available, in bunches, on bushes, on every back fence. On the back fence, like, just like that baby, slow like that, Hold me, hold me, oh yes, oh yes, just that way. Like, not yet, don't let me go yet, I'll make the train, but first I want to make you do that one more time. Matawin In the language of the Sioux people, Matawin is the name of the spirit of the female grizzly. The act of loosing the old skin is never easy, not even when we seek it, not even when we demand, not even when we call it forth. The skin that emerges, new pelt, coarse and dark, you will not trust at first, forgetting it is not the fur that is not yet ready. You emerged fresh from the blood tide, daughter of a woman not yet ready, caught fast in trapper snares, forgetting the paths that might have kept her free. She pulled you, young fur, wet and raw, pushed you, newborn, to a world of strange smells and trap-ridden tracks. Heaping curses upon your trusting life, she crossed you your arrogant persistence to birth, forgetting it was not only the child who must be ready. Mother cursed, you come to this birthing with persistence and fear. The daughter in you trembles fierce anticipation and rage. Playing all the parts this time, you paint yourself a world of strange smells and virgin track. Sister spirits attend you, 
Midwife warriors, honored and skilled, help you make ready, remembering the miracle in the blood tide, the power in the birthing, the joy in the crowning, when the heart of the grizzly is ready. Page of Wands I have struggled here in this hot, arid place for what feels like years. Have experienced the closeness of air moving too quickly and not at all. Have come to no dryness. Have felt my own skin scaled, scarred, heat-stained. Have known a thirst so great as to question my own survival. I have watched you rolling like thunder clouds across the yellow sky, have felt the breeze begin and grow and grow and whistle through my hollow body. I watch the sky grow dark, waiting now for the cleansing rain. Apprentice She instructs me in things I do not immediately understand. She says that I should stand alone, in the dark, with my eyes open. I complain that there is nothing to see. That is not the point, she says. The point is to practice standing alone, in the dark, with your eyes open.